Thank you. That sounded very enthusiastic. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about brand experience, but just a little bit of boredom on my background first. I do a lot of research into intellectual property strategy, so one of the things I do is talk to companies and clients across the world about how they would protect their brand. And the foundation of brands, as we know, is trademarks. Great that we're talking about foundations because we've got savvy, as speakers later, so very important in terms of constructing your brand. And it's an interesting sector because intellectual property and trademarks, which is my specialism in it, is a massively growing area. So if you're not registered as a trademark, but you are growing a brand, it's very important to think about that. And again, as Tom will say, in terms of franchising, when he's talking about McDonald's, there's also that element of buying into the brand as well. So what I would like to do is talk in two ways, really, and I'd like you to be slightly schizophrenic. I want you to think about you as a consumer of brands, because we've all grown up in a brand-rich environment, but you also as a brand delivering service to your customers. So slightly schizophrenic, the opposable mind, if you like, so you've got two ideas in your head at the same time. So, if you were moulding an Oscar-winning brand experience, what would you think about? Well, most of the research shows that there are specific brand drivers, if you like, which create the experience for any brand. And that's what you have to think about as a brand, but also what you are experiencing when you buy and consume brands. So is the brand meeting your needs? Is it okay for what you paid? Or is it actually doing something more for your brands? And also other things, is it a brand that understands your needs? And brands are competing much more um, effectively these days for your attention, but also in a very, very competitive marketplace. And there are other key elements of brand which I will, which I will move on to in our brief presentation. In terms of the brand experience, when we look at research, 60% of people generally say, well, actually, the brand experience, what I experience, is a key element. And also, it's a key element in why I will pay more for a particular brand. So that is an increasingly important element in the marketplace. So if we look at product experience, when you experience a new product or you've bought a new product, is it something that you feel has been developed for you specifically? Not necessarily handcrafted by elves specifically for you, but something that's really geared to your needs. The second thing is the shopping experience. How do you rate the shopping experience? Was it something which was hard work, or was it something that was quite enjoyable? And again, we all experience that, but we don't necessarily rate it at the time. And also, remember, our clients experience a particular brand experience when they're dealing with us. So sometimes we're quite happy to moan, and I'm guilty of this myself, I'm happy to moan about an issue I've had with a brand, but then I might say, oh, I'm not ringing that client back later today. Mm, maybe I'll give them a call next week. So I'm actually a hypocrite, but that's the nature of uh, being, in, uh, be being in a law firm. Then there's the customer experience. Is it something that you enjoyed, or is it something you want to run away from? And that customer experience is, again, something that can be measured and something that brands focus on very, very clearly. And then there's the community experience. Obviously, some of you don't live in the sort of close-knit community that I live in. This was our last nativity, um, although there is somebody from my village here, so there we go. He probably... I don't think you were in that one, Nigel, but there we are. But it's the community experience. Did you feel part of an elite group, an exclusive group, a tribe, which is what some brands are attempting to pull you into? Do you feel exclusive that you're driving that particular car? And some of the brands I worked with, with, work with, they spend an awful lot of money on that brand experience. How you, as a consumer, feel part of a community that you've bought into. And that's often the case with more elite brands that you're paying a lot more money for. And then there's the discovery experience. What was it like when you either discovered it, that brand anew or actually rediscovered it sometimes when it's been relaunched in a different format. And that's quite often the case that we find people are re-energising re trademarks from the past. And that, that's quite a key thing as well to think about. And then there's the digital experience. Far more important these days, either on your TV, on your laptop, on your handheld, on your mobile. And Bjorn will be talking a little bit more about that in his presentation. But that digital experience is something that's 
less relevant to somebody of my age group, but much more relevant to the younger members of the audience who grew up with YouTube, not just three miserable channels on television. And then there's the how the brand interacts with the audience. That's also key, and how indeed you interact. I was talking to the guy who founded Metro Bank, actually, who spoke here not that long ago, and it was, you know, he's written a book about fans, not customers. And that's why Metro Bank are doing so well themselves in terms of growing their brand. Great brand experience. Who's gone to Hollister? We, my wife and I went to Hollister in Reading, looking for things for our daughters, and A, you can't see anything, B, you can't hear anything, and there are no windows, but you think you're looking out on a beach. And it's kind of one of those brands where you think, can you turn the music down? Can you turn the lights on and what's that smell? We're the ones who are buying. So that's what you need when you go to Hollister. You need a reflective jacket so you can find your other half and a flashlight. <laughs> then another key area is whether you are actually delving into, if you like, the nature of the brand. Are you finding out what your clients actually feel and want? Not necessarily mind-melding, but actually, to some degree, there is that part of, if you like, neuro-linguistic programming where brands will, will look at these things. And it's not new. There's a very famous book called The Hidden Persuaders from the 1950s by Vance Packard, who talked about, well, what are the aspirations that people want with their brand? Why are they buying? What are their desires? What are their wants? What are their fears? Can we tap into those? And customer feedback has become very, very important. And we're bombarded, aren't we, by what did you think of our service on, on a scale of 1 to 55? What would you say about this? How would, could we improve our service? There is a downside to that, of course, which has become increasingly clear in the last few years. And I've been reading reports over the last couple of months that if actually you rely too much on client feedback, you end up producing something a bit too bland. You're trying to actually please too many people. And there have been criticisms, particularly in the car industry, of producing quite bland products because actually you've relied too much on customers. And frankly, sometimes customers don't know best. They say they want something, but actually, oh, when they've got it and you've spent millions developing it, they say, yeah, but it's a bit boring, isn't it? The other thing I really love about brands is the whole origin myths scenario where you think you've bought into this, you think you're going to this fantastic pizza place that actually grew up in 1920s Little Italy in New York, when actually, you know, it was founded in 1995 in Leicester, naming no names, of course. And that's an important element of so many brands, creating a na narrative. There's a really interesting history of um, denim just being um, published, and it's actually interesting to think about how denim was marketed and how those origin myths started. We all think that cowboys wore denim jeans, for example. John Wayne was rolling around in the Wild West having shootouts with Indians or with other outlaws. And actually, most cowboys, it seems, wore leather or canvas trousers, didn't wear denim. And then, of course, denim was also seen as, oh, it's so important, it's come to America. There was even a myth that Christopher Columbus's ships had denim sails when they arrived in America. So denim has seen various guises and phases to go from, if you like, workman's clothes to fashion accessories which now cost 100 or 200 pounds and are supposed to make you infinitely more successful with women if you wear them too tight. Although that kind of defeats the object to some degree. Okay, the younger members of the audience, are anybody here thinking Harry Potter, seen from Harry Potter? Yes, you at the back, I thought so. Actually, as I'm sure the learned members know, that's Richard Strauss, famous German composer. Why do I wish to talk about German composers? And you will have heard all of those German composers, Beethoven, Bach, Handel. You might even have heard of Schneider and Mutter. And you may definitely have heard of Richard Wagner in the middle. Why am I talking about that? Well, German composers are also important. And there are two other guys there, top and bottom in the centre, who you probably haven't heard of, but you've heard a lot of. Oscar Wetz and Tobias Beitz are the guys that com compose the door sounds for Mercedes cars and BMW cars, so that it sounds right as part of your buying experience, your brand experience. So it's interesting, isn't it, that brands will spend that kind of money and that level of detail to give you the brand experience you want. And BMW in particular, Oscar Vetz is the guy at the top, 
he's very, very keen that sporty doors sound a little bit different to clunky Torah doors or to, to, uh, or, or, or to more family-orientated cars. And actually, it's the key part of our experience, and we don't think brands are that detail-conscious, but they certainly are, and it's very interesting to think of that. And just in case, the two guys in black and white, does anybody remember Kraftwerk? Nobody will admit to it, that's fair enough. Of course, if you think of 1978 film The Driver, Ryan O'Neill was infinitely more interested in what the door sounded like when it was ripped off after he reversed it off than actually what it sounds like closing. Key part of brand experience. So, to sum up, both for you as insights into how brands approach you, but also how you should approach your clients as a brand, and we'll be hearing more about as a key, a key principle of a successful business. You know, are you developing services and products or experiences that meet your client needs? And are you talking to your clients about what their needs are? Because their needs change. And sometimes we just deliver the same vanilla irrespective of the client coming through the door. Are you trying to understand your clients, either in person or online? And are you continuing to serve and engage them after they've bought? Or, oh, they've bought, let's forget about them. Because that's the important part of lifetime value. And then, you know, can they get hold of you whenever, either online or on the phone? Because that's what you want. We all buy now, don't we? We buy at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning. If we can't sleep, we're on Amazon. And because the market has changed like that, that's a key element of what we all expect to some degree. And then there's either exceeding expectations or managing expectations. And that's, again, part of the communication process. So as a principle of a successful business, the brand being part of how you do business is absolutely essential. And your individual people as brand representatives is essential. You as a representative. You might be a consultant, but you are your brand. And what does your brand mean to your clients? Enough from me, because I'm getting into lecturer mode. I will now hand over to Bjorn. Thank you very much indeed.